Good morning. Welcome to our lecture on control and perception in network and automated vehicles. And as every week, we start the lecture with, with a slide about the privacy policy. We would like to start today's lecture with an advertisement. Tomorrow is Tag Day Informatic, Day of Computer Science at the RWTH. So you are welcome to join Tag Day Informatic. There will be also companies joining the Tag Day Informatic. So you can also speak to companies if you are interested in internships or similar. And it is not limited to computer science students. So feel free to register. And there will be also a short presentation of one PhD student of uh, my group. Uh, it's Maximilian Klug. Well, um, before starting today's lecture, I would like to make an announcement. If you go to the lab website, cpm.embedded.rwth-aachen.de, and you go to resources and education, you find a lecture <clears throat> at the top. If you go to read me, you will find the course materials of last year. Um, what you see here is a short summary about the lecture some key facts, which you already know, a description. You find also recommended literature, learning objectives, um, divided into knowledge and understanding, what you should uh, be able to do after this course, skills and competences, our lecture style, which you already know, lab style exam evaluation uh, of last, the last term and some statistics. And if you go more down, you find the course materials of last year. You find the lecture slides um, of all lectures and they are very similar to the lecture slides of this year. So if you would like to look into the slides before our lecture, or if you would like to make notes on, uh, on the lecture slides, then you can use these slides. I will always update the slides after the lecture and upload to um, to model. So you find here also the exercise sheets, which we share also with, with you on Moodle. Of course, you find here the version of, uh, of last year. You can also find the MATLAB code of last year. We're going to share more code with you in this term. Patrick is in the process of uh, implementing some code for you for some experimentations. Um, 
last but not least, you find the lab tasks, um, or the lab task divided into uh, introduction, case study, and free development. And here you find, uh, as always, you start with a documentation and with the provided software from us. Well, with this, we can start today's lecture. Before starting, we discussed uh, last week about the longitudinal vehicle model, and we discussed if it is uh, developed for the longitudinal vehicle axis or for the direction of movement for the velocity direction. And I discussed this topic with Patrick after the lecture and the model we developed in this lecture is for the vehicle axis. And we updated the slides also and use the index long in case we, uh, we mean the vehicle axis and X and Y as in indices if we mean uh, the global coordinate system. So we will upload the slides, the updated slides uh, there is just one drawing missed in the slides. I will complete it in the next days. And yeah, take a look at it. And uh, if you still have questions, please don't hesitate to ask us. So now, uh, welcome to the part three of this lecture, control engineering and uh, optimization. It is one of the core parts of, uh, of this course. Yeah, as in every part, we start looking at the course content. Uh, dynamic vehicle models is done. And uh, yeah, today we are going to look at control and optimization. Uh, it will take two maybe two and a half or three lectures, we will see how we proceed and uh, yeah, how your interest is in deeping some knowledge. And to find uh, this topic in the lab architecture, I show this slide, it is the general lab architecture. And uh, I would say this part is in the decision making. So this control and optimization. And uh, yeah, the control is obviously here at the bottom. Um, yeah, for routing, behavior, and trajectory planning, we can use optimization. The optimization you're going to learn here is more suitable for trajectory, maybe also for behavior, but it is an overkill for, for the route. Here's a slide about uh, external literature. The first one is a general book about modern control systems, the part of control engineering. I took this book because uh, it is in, in English and it is one of the uh, famous books in control engineering in, in English, but there are also many other uh, sources in German also. So if you, uh, studied uh, control engineering at IRT or in uh, systems theory, you don't need to, uh, to buy this book. 
so you can use the materials you you have you, you already have the second literature is the most famous book in optimization for engineering uh, people and it is about convex optimization uh, professor boyd is from the stanford university um, the book is very well written so it is a good source for convex optimization the third literature is about predictive control so it is somehow a combination between control and optimization and the book i am suggesting here is the book i am using for this liter for this lecture but there are also many other resources also available uh, in the in the internet so you are not restricted to to this book but it is the book i um, i look in when uh, when i need some yeah some knowledge in predictive control so as said there are many other literature so if you uh, had courses in control and optimization during your study you don't need uh, to to use this literature you can use the literature you're familiar with and here are some literature from uh, me so the first one uh, you find the basics of predictive control in in this uh, thesis and uh, also for the optimization part you will uh, yeah you will you will read a part of it in in the optimization part that i tell you when when we are going to yeah, to to handle it the second one is also about uh, optimization and control uh, for trajectory planning this one is again um, about uh, how to to solve and the term solve we are going to define during this le lecture or the next lecture um, yeah it is how to solve non-convex uh, optimization problem for uh, predictive control the next one is also similar um, the this one is with an interesting uh, implementation of of racing vehicle racing yeah in the last one you find uh, code i have written for uh, network model predictive control for weak collision avoidance so we will find uh, control optimization and also uh, some network uh, perspectives so I will tell you when when to look inside and where to look inside. Of course, you're free to uh, to just download it and uh, use it. So today's lecture is a flipped classroom. Team B should already have prepared a summary, and the task was to uh, watch this video and to read the summary from this thesis and optionally to look inside this book well now i will stop my screen sharing and the person who prepared 
the summary, please, or the group or the team, please share your screen and give the summary. Yeah, so that would be us, group B. Okay. Just a quick question. Um, have you disabled uploading files to the chat? I wanted to upload the slides um, beforehand. I don't know, Patrick. Um, I'm looking into it, not sure. So you mean the Zoom chat, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, I'm looking into it. Shall I wait or start anyway? I think you should just start. I'll send it once the chat works. Yeah, I think also go ahead and uh, you can share it afterwards. Okay. So yeah, we are Group B and we will, uh, today we will present the topic model predictive control. Um, I'm Julia and uh, I will do the first half of our presentation and Dominic will take over the second half of the presentation. And uh, yeah, afterwards we can answer all the questions. Um, we have all turned uh, on our cameras so we will all, all participate in answering the questions. It's not only Dominic and I. Okay, so let's start. So MPC is also known as receding horizon control and it is an optimal control method which can deal with multi-variable uh, constraint control problems uh, in a very effective way. And uh, for example, in almost every system we have constraints and those constraints represent limits on uh, the system itself and its inputs, for example. And uh, as an example, uh, if a level must not overflow, or um, yeah, this isn't a constraint on the output value, or for example, constraints on the temperature that are not supposed to exceed. Um, these are further examples for constraints. And MPC is a very efficient, uh, um, has a very efficient way to handle those um, system, uh, systems that have constraints. And uh, yeah, we solve those um, issues or um, like those, uh, problems with an optimal control uh, approach. And we will um, yeah, listen about that later on a little more. The general goal of uh, MPC is to use a dynamic model to predict future system behavior by expecting its future, um, future states and uh, that in terms of control inputs. And we optimize those inputs over a finite time prediction horizon. So let's see what that horizon actually means. So in general, um, the, um, our control problem is that we want to compute optimal control inputs. And we know from the last lectures, the state space representation that we can see on the slides here. I hope you can see my mouse pointer. Um, so uh, yeah, so we can, um, yeah, we know the state space uh, representation and this is now discretized in time so that we get a uh, discrete time state uh, space representation. Therefore we have, look that one here. Um, therefore, we have finitely many uh, optimization variables and normal equations instead of uh, differential equations. So it's easier to handle that. And uh, to receive an optimal result, we would have to use an infinite time horizon for our computation. And that's infeasible for various reasons. Some of them are mentioned on the side. And uh, yeah, so instead of solving this infinite, infinite dimensional problem, we simply run it uh, out to time t. And that is some finite horizon that we use. So within that horizon, we plan uh, our optimization. And uh, yeah, of course it's not the optimal solution, but we get a, su a suitable uh, approximation and um, that is easier to compute because yeah, we are looking over finite dimensional subspace and not the whole dimensional subspace, uh, whole dimensional space. So um, yeah, In additionally, we have the receding horizon, which is based on that idea. But what we do here is we only apply the first control input, uh, UT, from our optimal solution and we discard all the other steps. But uh, you will understand that in a second because I will give an example now how that works. So here we can see, um, or what I will show you now is uh, two iterations of MPC uh, in this example. And uh, first now we see the reference trajectory. Um, that is supposed to, uh, to be the feasible trajectory to reach our goal set point sequence. So um, for example, let's say that our goal set point sequence is 150 kilometers per hour. It would be like instantaneously 150 kilometers per hour, but no system could drive that fast. Um, like there's no system that could do it instantaneously. So we have a reference trajectory that tries to get um, to that value m m in an optimal way. And we try to reach that reference trajectory by our computation. 
So now we are at time point T here. And on the uh, left side is the past, and on the right side is the future. So let's go through this. Now, what we see is uh, the multidimensional control inputs, which are these from the past that we already have um, done. And uh, what we additionally have is the measured trajectory here. So that is the trajectory that has happened until now, and we need to incorporate that in our future computation. Now we see a little more. So uh, we have two different control horizons now, uh, horizons now. The one is the control horizon, HU. That is the horizon in which we can like change our input values within our um, optimization comp computation. So that's how for now at that current time, our um, input should look like to reach our goal trajectory. Um, after that control horizon, we're not supposed to do any more control uh, input changes. So as you see the dash line, it's uh, not changing anymore. Additionally, we have the prediction horizon HP. That is the whole, um, like the whole future that we look into. For example, if we take an ACC system on the highway, then we want to predict for the next five, I don't know, milliseconds or something, um, how to react or what to do. And that would be the whole prediction horizon that we use for the computation. Um, so what happens now at time point T, we initialize our, um, yeah, our computation at this time step and compute a trajectory of control inputs. Um, yeah, with which we uh, get this, with the inputs, we get this model-based predictive trajectory to reach the reference trajectory. And uh, yeah, that is, therefore we optimize our objective function that we will get to know in a second, given our system model. And then we only apply the first, um, the first time step. So the first, um, um, optimal input of our optimized solution, which would be like, this is the input. So we would only take this optimized input and we just discard all the other inputs. Um, yeah, the reason for that is um, because of model inaccuracy. So maybe the system did not react in the way we actually wanted it to react. So if we apply all those inputs now, it could happen that our model-based trajectory uh, will not reach the reference trajectory, but like, I don't know, go somewhere else because our system did not react the way we wanted it. So we only take the first um, input to reach this point. Now we go to T plus one to the next time step. And uh, yeah, what we do is like, we shifted the horizon now from T plus one to T plus one plus HU for the control horizon and from T plus one to T plus one plus HP to, uh, for the prediction horizon. And we start all over again. So we uh, compute the optimal strategy again. We uh, have a new optimal input for the next step. And uh, yeah, we take that input and discard the rest again. And we do that all the time. Um, yeah, so to ensure that our optimal input is not infeasible, we have additional constraints, uh, like an upper bound of uh, our input U, but we will say more about that in a minute. Um, yeah, so that's how we use, in general, a dynamic model to pre predict the future system behavior by expecting its future states in terms of control inputs and uh, optimize the inputs over a finite discrete uh, prediction horizon H, as I've shown you here. So let's get to the prediction. Give me a second here. Um, yeah, so what we have here is, uh, yeah, we've, uh, we use a dynamic model to predict the future system behavior. And it is hard to choose an appropriate model because um, there are advantages of complex models. Like, and like, for example, if you have a complex model, you get optimal control inputs. But the disadvantage is that you have an even higher computational um, uh, computation time. And um, yeah, therefore, a good rule is to choose a simple model, which is, which is accurate enough to make prediction um, within this prediction horizon. So we generally have a discrete time model, which you can see on the slide on the, uh, the up to um, equations. And um, yeah, X can be a multidimensional state. Um, here we can see that X can be multidimensional states, U are multidimensional control inputs, and Y are multidimensional control outputs. And the two functions that we can see um, uh, in the equations F is the state's evolution function, which is used to predict the next state, and G is an output function. Um, yeah, so additionally, um, for uh, computation time reduction, um, we use a lin linearized model of um, those two equations, or of this model, uh, and that one is incorporated in the MPC algorithm. 
So it's in those two equations down here. And they, uh, yeah, those uh, equ uh, equations result from the linearization using time variant matrices. And it can be done around current, uh, the current operating um, point or around the trajectory at each operating point um, in the prediction horizon. So what we see here is A is the um, system matrix, B is the input matrix, and E is the affine term that we use, and uh, C is the output matrix. And uh, for the argument T, um, T plus I, it is a, yeah, the argument is a variable that de denotes the i's future time step um, that is predicted uh, at the current uh, step of uh, the variable and uh, neglecting disturbances and measurement noise, all future st um, state vectors can be predicted using uh, the system model through iterative substitution. Okay, so let's go over to optimization and Dominic will take over from now. Yes. Do you want to share the screen or? Uh, yeah. Okay. I think you have to stop sharing in this case. Yeah. Um, just a second. Okay. All right. So you should see my screen now, right? Um, okay, um, so we've, uh, Julia already said that um, in MPC, our goal is to optimize um, the control input. So we, um, when looking at our finite time horizon, we want to ca calculate the optimal control inputs for that horizon. Um, and of course, to perform that optimization, we need some goal. And this goal is given by the um, cost function. Um, and the cost function is shown here at the bottom. So it consists basically of two parts, uh, the left term and the right term. And the left term, we start from X, which is our internal state, um, R, which is the reference trajectory. So which is basically the external input we get uh, for the target uh, we want to achieve. Um, and those two terms are combined um, by the cost uh, function LX, uh, which basically takes the difference between uh, our internal state and the reference trajectory and compute some cost for it. So uh, if the difference between our reference trajectory and the internal state increases, so if we um, get further away from our reference trajectory, our cost increases and it goes down, um, the, the closer we get to the reference trajectory. So that's the first term. And uh, the second term uh, is regarding our uh, control input we generate um, and more specifically regarding the uh, uh, changes in the control input that we generate. So U is of course our control input and delta U is the change uh, we have in this time step uh, compared to the last one. Um, and what this term does uh, is if delta U increases, then we assign a higher cost uh, to this term. And what this basically um, leads to is that we uh, prevent the system from doing too rapid changes. So you could think about if we, uh, for example, change from high acceleration to high deceleration in one time step, this would be a very radical change and would be probably bad for the passengers and bad for the vehicle. And this is prevented by this term because a very high cost would be assigned to such a, a drastic change. Um, yeah, and this whole cost function as in total is uh, minimized uh, in the optimization part. Okay, I would like to switch to the next, okay. Um, yeah. So that's uh, the optimization. And what's also uh, very interesting about MPC is that we can incorporate constraints into the uh, problem. So we can have uh, constraints on the control inputs, so on U and on delta U, uh, on the control outputs, which is um, Y, uh, and on the internal states, so this is X. Um, and the constraints can look uh, like this. So we define some sets that are feasible, that we deem to be feasible, and um, we uh, force the system to only consider states uh, that are inside this feasible set. Um, this can be very useful. For example, if you think about vehicle collision avoidance, uh, we can define that we have some roadblock, for example, on, on the road. So there's, a, for example, a parking vehicle uh, that we don't want to crash into. And what we can do, we can uh, exclude the position of this parked vehicle from our internal state. And uh, by doing that, we force the system to never get into a state 
where we uh, are at the same position as the parked vehicle, so where we basically crash. Um, yeah, and such a uh, constraint could be uh, incorporated by just removing it from the feasible set, and then it won't be uh, considered for the optimization, and uh, we will never hit that state, if it is possible to never hit it. Um, yeah, uh, that's basically it for this example. Um, and here you see a, a very basic and very reduced overview how such an MPC controller could look. So at the top, we have the optimizer. Um, this performs our optimization. At the bottom, we have our model. And uh, we see that the cost function, which we have just seen, is an input to the optimizer. And the optimizer then uh, calculates the optimal control inputs for the next T steps. So T is uh, here the uh, length of the uh, uh, horizon. Uh, so of, of the horizon we use. And the optimizer, this uh, output from the optimizer is, of course, input again to the model. And the model can, based on our control inputs that, we, uh, that the optimizer generated, can uh, predict how the system, so how, the, uh, yeah, how our actual system will behave. And this uh, prediction is, again, input into the optimizer. So you see this is a loop. Um, OK. And uh, specifically, the input is uh, to the optimizer is the difference between what the model is predicted uh, we, we have and between the reference trajectories. So this is uh, basically what the LX term in the cost function does. Um, yeah. And this then jointly optimized. And at the end, we uh, take just the first time step from uh, the control inputs U. So this U is for T time steps. And we just take the first one at the current time step, and this is what we apply, and then we will compute, as uh, Julia said. Okay, so um, let's look at some advantages of MPC. Um, so um, one advantage is that this concept of iterative comp recomputation, so which means that we just uh, calculate for the next t time steps, but just apply the first time step. And then the next time step, we recompute everything. And this iterative computation uh, introduces feedback into MPC. And what this does is it creates a robustness to disturbances and to model inaccuracies. So uh, Julia already said this, but I repeat it uh, for this point. So um, if, for example, our model is inaccurate and doesn't predict the system very well, um, then if we would just we would apply our whole plan for the whole T time steps, we would not end up in the target that we wanted to achieve because some uh, because the model predicted the reality wrong. Uh, and we can um, mitigate this by always only applying the first time step and then recomputing everything. So we rely less on the, on the good prediction of the model um, and are more robust if the prediction isn't that good. And the same holds for disturbances. Um, yeah, well now another advantage is that we can consider time delays of sensors and actuators directly in the algorithm. And to illustrate that, I'll go back to the, this slide. Um, so if you think about a sensor that has a delay, so the, uh, we are at uh, time step t right now, and we know that the sensor has a time delay of one time step. So at time t, we read from the sensor what actually happened at time step t minus one. And when we have such a case, we can use our model to uh, perform a prediction or to, yeah, to perform a prediction of the sensor value based on the data we have for time step t minus one, how the uh, value will be probably for time step t. And then we can use that predicted value uh, to do our computations. And the same holds for sensors. So if we have, uh, for actuators, and if we have, for example, an actuator that only actuates with one time step uh, delay. So if we input, uh, can generate a control input now at time step t, then it will only be applied at t plus one. Then uh, we can uh, incorporate that in our model and just generate a control input for the next time step using the model to predict how our system will behave uh, in, the, in the intermediate period. Yeah, this is uh, about time delay. Also, what's another advantage is that uh, MPC can handle multiple in and outputs. So we can have multiple uh, variables we control in the system and we can have multiple sensor inputs. Um, yeah, of course, we have seen that it can handle constraints. So I've already said constraints can be used for, for example, collision avoidance. But another example is we can enforce physical constraints of the system 
So if the system, for example, cannot accelerate more than a certain uh, value, then we can also put this into uh, the constraints and uh, the model will take it into account. Um, yeah, and also, of course, MPC has the preview capability. So we have seen that uh, MPC predicts the next T time steps. And um, by doing this, we can, if we see that in, for example, in 10 time steps, there's a corner around which we uh, have to go and we have to be at a certain speed to take that corner, then we can already 10 time steps in advance um, start to decelerate so that we don't have to perform rapid deceleration at the corner to be at the right speed. Um, so we already take the future into account when planning our current actions. Okay, so in summary, MPC is a very widely used uh, control approach. It can be used in classical control applications, so like vehicle control, but also in, uh, for example, supply chain management, which is a very, usually very distant topic from control theory. Um, yeah, it's, MPC, as already said, uses um, a finite time horizon T to approximate for the optimal best case infinite time horizon control. And using this, it creates a plan for the next T time steps out of which only the first is applied and the rest is discarded. And this is iterated over and over again. And what this leads to is very good performance in practice. And in particular, um, it performs good even if the model is bad uh, precisely because we always only apply the first input and then discard the rest. Okay, yeah, thanks for your attention. I will switch back to the summary slide and feel free to ask questions. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, so it was a good performance in practice to repeat the, the last point. So your performance but also very good. <laughs> Thanks. So it is uh, really a very nice summary of uh, predictive control. Uh, before going to the uh, Q&A session, I would like to take a short break. So please uh, stop the screen sharing and uh, take a break. You can discuss with each other here or in uh, in a breakout session, what you would like, I would say around five minutes. And I have to uh, yeah, go and come back in around five minutes. So see you. Well, I'm back. And uh, so we continue with the Q and a session um, yeah group B would be happy to answer your questions so please turn on your microphone and just ask um, I would like to ask a question yeah maybe. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I missed it during the presentation, but I would like to know how you um, calculate the size of the time horizon. Like, how, how do you know how many time steps you calculate like in, before, like how many iterations you make before? If you want, I can answer that. Um, so the, the time horizon is um, just a question about um, the computing time. So um, it, um, if the time horizon is bigger, so the, the accuracy of the optimization is better. But if it is too big, then we can't um, have a real time calculation because we have to calculate it in a certain time. So we can um, yeah, calculate the input for the next time step. So I think it's just a question about the computation time that limits the horizon. Ah, okay. So you always um, like maybe fix some number which is based on that computational um, effort and the computational power you have. 
think it also depends on uh, like the application that you use. For example, in ACC, you need like milliseconds or something and other applications need like maybe, I don't know, maybe they, they are easier and you can have a longer time span or something. I think it depends on that. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Yeah. yeah, but I think basically it's, it's a predefined um, part of the MPC algorithm. So it's not changed on the fly, but it's set prior before you start uh, using the algorithm and then always the same time horizon is used. But when you choose it, so before you implement your algorithm, you can take those things into account. So how long you need to calculate and, and so on. Yeah. And there's uh, one more thing. If the um, horizon is too small, the um, whole system can be instable. That could be a big problem. Okay, thank you. Julia, Dominic, or Dominic, could you share your slides again? Yeah, second. Well, maybe you can go to, to the slide with the... Um, uh, which slide, sorry? Of NPC. Uh, uh, which one? Sorry. The principle. I, I don't remember. Slide. Maybe say it again. Yeah, principle of MPC, the yeah, so graph this, you mean, right? Yeah, this this one. one. Yeah. Well, uh, the question about the predictions uh, horizons, uh, we call them prediction and control horizon, uh, is very interesting because the, uh, how to choose both is really interesting Be because they are parameters. So we cannot uh, actually to compute optimal uh, HU and HP, we have to know the solution of the optimization problem. So it is an optimization inside an optimization. So it is, uh, in practice, it is more engineering what we do here. Uh, of course, we, uh, we calculate and compute. We are engineers and computer science scientists. So of course, we, uh, we compute things. Uh, the answers you, you gave are, are right. Um, it depends also, of course, on the application, as Julia said. Uh, actually, in ACC, I would uh, rather say that we need a prediction horizon of some seconds, uh, not milliseconds. <laughs> yes, fine. Um, yeah, um, further comment on, on this, we, we usually say how many steps we are going to predict and uh, yeah, if you want to get the prediction time, you have to multiply the, the, the steps by the sample time. So usually we, we speak about steps because uh, the model is discrete. Oh, this is an uh, important comment. Um, yeah. What is also important here? Maybe I could add something yeah. to that? Yeah, please add something. Um, to the uh, time discrete model, uh, maybe I think the moment I understood that was when I saw uh, like uh, the optimized inputs that you see on this slide, um, they are like boxes. So you have like uh, concrete values that, yeah, that you can use uh, and, uh, as an input for your system. And uh, they are uh, not infinitely many, but finitely many. And if you don't do this time discretion or discretization, discretization, I think it is, yeah. uh, then you'd, you would have a curve instead of those boxes, let's say. So you would have infinitely many inputs and uh, yeah, that would be infeasible. So that's how maybe you can imagine that. 
um, this optimized inputs, if you dis uh, discretize them, then it's uh, yeah easier to handle that and it, it's feasible in that case. Yeah. So also uh, to decide the right prediction horizon, a good measure is also how how good is the model. Because if you if you have a good model, very accurate model, and if you assume that disturbances uh, are well controlled, then you can of of course use uh, longer prediction horizons. But if you know that your model uh, is not really very accurate, then I would suggest to, to have smaller prediction horizon. Uh, for, for example, if we think uh, about linear and non-linear models, uh, if we have a highly non-linear system, and we model it using a linear model, or we model it using a non-linear model and linearize, uh, it would be the same. So I would say in this case, if we uh, linearize around the operating point, so the model would be less and less accurate in the prediction horizon. And I would suggest to choose a smaller prediction horizon. Uh, of course, there are also, um, well, let's say this, what, what I said is uh, the basics of MPC. There are also advanced techniques to, uh, to handle non-linearities in the optimization problem. Well, I think uh, this is uh, enough comments from my side about <laughs> prediction horizon. If you have further comments or questions, so please go ahead. Uh, I have a question. If it's yeah. possible to set hard limits, for example, on steering angle in the car, there's a hard limit on that. But I'm not sure how to implement that into such a controller. So if you, I've changed back to the constraint slides. So um, you see here that we can, can have um, a set U of feasible control inputs. So our control input would be the steering angle in this case. And we can just define that valid are only values, for example, between minus one and one. So our set U only contains values between minus one and one. And then we enforce, but by, by defining this constraint, we enforce that the steering angle we generate has to lie within minus one and one. And so we, we have applied such a constraint. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how that, can you show the formula for the integral that's computed or the sum? This one? Yeah. So to solve MPC, uh, we solve uh, a convex optimization problem. And we can add those constraints to the uh, convex optimization problem. So those, are, those constraints are in addition to the cost function. So we optimize the cost function with respect to some constraints. Ah, OK. Yeah, then that answers it. OK. OK. Um, I have a question too. Uh, is there a possibility to estimate if a model is um, real time capable or if it's too complex Be uh, before you actually uh, implement it on a PC? I guess I'll answer again. So, um, Real-time capability, as far as I understand, as, uh, as far as I understand, only means that you have a fixed bound on your computing time, and um, by having this finite horizon, 
Um, and of course, you need to have some model that uh, satisfies those real time bounds. So you can't have a model that needs infinite computation time. Um, but if your model satisfies those real time bounds um, and your control horizon is appropriate so that you uh, can calculate it in a time you, you want to achieve, then it should work. Oh, OK, thanks. I would like also to comment this question. It's a really good question. It is uh, still uh, in, yeah, in many research institutes, uh, a research que question. How, uh, yeah, how to get the MPC in practice in real time, and also how to uh, prove that it is going to be in, in, in real time. So my, uh, my practice driven answer about, uh, about this, uh, it's also uh, somehow in practice uh, more engineering. Well, um, it depends on, in many cases on the application. In case of, uh, for example, adaptive cruise control, the example of Julia, um, the sample time could be, I assume on a motorway, maybe 100 milliseconds. So you can think in one tenth of a second, uh, if you drive with maybe 100 to 150 kilometers per hour, uh, in, in this time, not a lot of things will, will happen. It is totally fine to have a sample time of 100 milliseconds. But if you have uh, a combustion engine control, for example, then you, you will need to, to have uh, smaller sample times uh, because a lot of things happen in uh, in few milliseconds. So you, you, can, you can think about the engine, what the engine does, and uh, which processes uh, are conducted. Uh, just think of your, of your car, of, uh, of a car you were sitting in, and you will have more feeling about the sample times and the different processes. So, so it, uh, it depends on uh, strongly on the application. So this is about the sample time. And uh, now what influences the computation time is the prediction horizon and control horizon. So uh, the sample time, prediction horizon, control horizon, and computation time depend strongly. And of course, uh, they depend again also on, on the application. What also uh, adds to the computation time is the model itself. Uh, before speaking about the model, I would like to define uh, the word model here. There are two models. Uh, the model of the system, the process model. For example, in the case of vehicle, look at part two of this lecture, but also the modeling of the optimization problem. So how we write the optimization problem, we call it also modeling. So the word model is differently uh, used. So um, what we saw in this lecture till now is modeling of an optimization problem. So, but uh, yeah, I wanted to comment on the uh, process model, the dynamic model we say also. Um, yeah, the size of, of the model and the complexity of the model, its nonlinearity uh, influence the computation time. Um, 
size of a model, uh, what I mean by, by size of a model is the number of, of states in, in the model. Uh, what we can do if the number of states is high, well, if you want to have uh, accurate computations, then you keep the number of, of states, but maybe it is uh, not feasible uh, in real time to have such a number of states. So what we, we do is we, we reduce the, the model to a less accurate model, but still to a model representing the, uh, the real process. And this, what I have now explained in some seconds, is a huge research topic. How to produce models to, uh, to be still accurate, to represent the, the original model, and to be computationally uh, efficient. So these were some comments on the computation time. There are also uh, many other, and uh, this topic can uh, can be further discussed in uh, in long uh, PhDs. But this was the short answer for, for this lecture. For the participants, if you have further questions, just uh, turn on your microphone. Team B would be happy to answer your questions, and I would like us to comment on the questions. Maybe I have some questions or comments. Uh, do we have a slide where we have the full formulation with objective function and constraints? No, okay. No, 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 uh, no I, I think we have it separated. Yeah, no problem. Uh, we can, you can show the objective function. Yeah. I would like to comment here on, uh, on delta u. So it is also possible if you would like to use u in the objective function. You are not forced to use delta u, but it is very common in, uh, in control engineering to use the change of the, of the input uh, in the objective function. Um, uh, a second comment on, uh, on the receding horizon and on uh, the repetition of computations in each time step. Uh, Julia mentioned the model inaccuracies uh, and what we discussed also in, uh, in last lecture about control engineering, the disturbances also are also a source for inaccuracies. And uh, this is why we should uh, repeat the computations uh, again and again. Um, could you go to slide eight? I have a comment on it. So my first comment is, uh, if you look at the feedback of the predicted output, there is no arrow. So that uh, the direction is clear for me, but in general, in block diagrams, we we draw also an arrow. Ah, here, yeah. you mean here? Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. It is the same after control inputs. Mm -hmm. um, uh, a general comment on uh, on the minus sign in the control engineering community, especially in Germany, we put the minus sign uh, to the right 
of the of the up row which should be minus so if if you mean here r minus y then the minus should be uh, no uh, here yeah to the oh, okay. right yeah okay So the in interesting thing about MPC, what we we, we saw, saw in your uh, presentation, Julia and Dominic, is uh, that M MPC is more a way of thinking than uh, equations and uh, certain control scheme. It is more the way uh, we, we think in uh, yeah, in in controlling a system when we have knowledge about the model and we have time for computation. Well, if there are no further questions, I would like also to show a, a short summary from my side. Now you should see my my slides. Okay. Now we we see the first slide of the of of my summary. So I took the example of uh, pedestrian walking walking to uh, start explaining MPC. So it. Uh, consists of uh, of the task so i define a task uh, we have the sense plan act scheme which we we already know so for the task think of uh, of you walking very slowly uh, in the in the first step maybe you think uh, of uh, the first time you walked in your life Maybe you cannot remember it, no problem. Uh, if you know some child's, uh, just uh, yeah. observe them walking and think of how they, uh, they learn walking. So uh, the task is to follow a line. So I will draw some line and we start at this position and here is the target. So here's, here, here is where we, we start. And the task is to act as little as possible. So as, uh, yeah, as many times in life, we want to invest uh, little money and get big money, we want to invest less energy and get uh, maximum output. So um, we want to act as little as possible, but we want to get uh, an output as uh, maximum as, as possible. So, but uh, at the same time, we have to con consider some, some limits, physical or logical limits. So I would change the the color, maybe I take the black one. So assume this is this is a street. We have the 
borders of the street. And these are, I would say, it depends how, on your interpretation, uh, if, if they are just lines on the road or if they are real borders, if they are physical or, or logical. So, but I would say that these are uh, limits. We want to follow the line, but at the same time, we want to, uh, to consider physical and logical limits. And to the limits, uh, what also belongs to the limit is uh, our limits, our body limits. Well, if we go through the sense plan act scheme, then we start with sense. In sense, we have the first point use sensic organs. So the sensic organs for following a line, the best uh, organ is, uh, I would say, the eyes. So this little guy has now eyes. <laughs> and we, uh, we build an environment model. The word, the word model is here in, in bold uh, because it is different model from the vehicle model. So it is an environment model, means uh, uh, what is in, in, the, in the environment, uh, um, obstacles or other people, uh, the, um, the, the, the street, uh, um, the objects in general, the objects in, in the environment. So then we go to plan, which is uh, more or less the MPC. Use the street model to anticipate your free movement for five time steps or for five steps. So I would like to change the color. Maybe I take now green one. So free movement means uh, how I stay now. If I continue walking without, uh, without following explicitly, without following the line where I will B. For example, assume this, this guy is looking in, in this direction and the guy is at this point. If, uh, if he or she continue, then we would have this point. Assume uh, the person here is moving with a constant velocity then the points would be at equidistance uh, or equidistant. Here is three, four, five. So I assume that the person is walking straight. So this is the uh, anticipation of the free movement for the next five steps. If you think of the presentation of uh, Julia and Dominic, this is uh, the prediction. And the five steps are the prediction horizon. Now consider your physical limits, your body limits, um, which means it depends on, uh, on the speed you're moving with you cannot change your direction uh, rapidly. Of course, as uh, as human being, uh, if you are staying, you can turn around yeah, uh, 360 degrees at place, no problem. But, but you are moving, you cannot turn at once. So you have to con consider also this. This is an example of uh, of the of the physical or body limits, but they are also more you can think of them. So consider physical and logical limits on your action. 
yeah, what uh, what actions are are possible. The position to uh, to stay in the in the street bounds. Here are the street bounds, for example. And uh, on the orientation, so we can put also some uh, limits on on the orientation in which direction to uh, to look. Well, the next step is plan your actions for two steps. That means we have maybe I take another color, which colors are open. Be blue. So we have uh, here the free movement of the five steps. And now we would like to, uh, to minimize the difference between, I take green again. We, we want to, to minimize this. Distance, so we would like to to stay on uh, on the line, and yeah, we we have to stay on the line. Uh, means not exactly on on the line. Of course, uh, it is better to to have an error of of zero, but. Uh, in general, in uh, in control engineering, we accept small errors. We are forced to accept small errors. So, and uh, the task is to minimize these errors, considering some constraints. So, and we plan our our action for two, two time steps. This is the control horizon. So, I um, I'm not going to. To, to write the action here in in this picture, but schematically we have to uh, to plan one uh, yeah one one action here and one action here. So I'm using these two actions. I would like to minimize the error along the line not just the two, the five, okay? And the last uh, step in our scheme is act. Move one step using some muscles of your body, which means here, uh, run the first plan. We run just the first one and um, yeah, some people could be disappointed by this point. We planned uh, five steps, or we, we predicted five steps. We planned two steps and we apply just one. Okay, it is uh, like this. So like some politicians say, uh, plan globally or think globally, act locally. <laughs> It is the same uh, in, uh, in predictive control here. So we still have some minutes, so I can uh, continue showing my, my summary about uh, MPC. And this is an example about vehicles. So the, um, in the lecture title, we have always the word vehicle and our example is uh, most of times uh, about vehicles. So here we have uh, a vehicle. The task is to minimize the distance between the vehicle position and the reference uh, trajectory. The reference trajectory is a line in, in this case. The vehicle is moving, moving with a constant uh, velocity and uh, we can act using the steering wheel. So in classical control, without thinking about 
uh, productive control, um, it is very similar to, uh, yeah, to uh, making a hole in the ground of the vehicle and looking down and trying to follow the line. This is what happens if you don't have predictions in, um, in the control. So imagine you have to, to drive, you don't look out of the, uh, of the wine shield, you look down through a hole. This is the classical control. Modern or predictive control is you look out of the wine shield, what we do as human beings, and uh, yeah, we, uh, we don't have to, to drive to, to the tree. We don't have to drive on the blocked line, so we have to follow the line, but at the same time to, uh, to choose the free uh, lane in, in this trip. This is uh, a nice example about uh, MPC and uh, the classical control. Another example, which is uh, also uh, very exciting, is the chess example. And uh, yeah, think of what uh, what you do playing chess. So it is very, very similar to uh, to MPC what what we do. So first, uh, the goal is to. Uh, to win, <laughs> of course, and uh, the, the similarity is we have a model, our knowledge about the game. This is uh, the model, and in the model, we have also the, um, the regulations uh, that we have the, um, yeah, the brain with the matrix, uh, we have different figures and we can move them with different ru rules and so on. This is the model or constraints, uh, how you would like to, to model. So we have here uh, objective, we have constraints, uh, the very similar thing to, to MPC, we predict, that means we plan uh, many steps as you, as you can with your uh, brain bar. And of course, in, in, in the given time, this is what happens also in, in MPC, uh, you predict many steps, but you think of, uh, of the actions of few steps because your brain power maybe is, uh, okay, it depends on, on your level in, in chess, so how many uh, steps you can predict and how many uh, steps you can think of taking actions. But at the end, and this is also <laughs> the disappointing point in, in MPC maybe, uh, we take just one action at, uh, at a time and then the next player is in turn. So if you, uh, are, if you have experience in playing chess, so think uh, again, similar like the pedestrian example, not of, uh, of you as, uh, as adult or as uh, an experienced player, think of how you would explain somebody who uh, who has no knowledge in, in chess, what, what, what are you doing now? What are you thinking and how you would like to, uh, to win? And uh, yeah, in, in, in this example, uh, the task is to, uh, to have, uh, how, how do you say, uh, a checkmate in two moves. So I would give you this, uh, yeah, this task till next week, 
uh, of course you can use the slides from from last year but i would suggest that you uh, use first your uh, yeah brain power to to get to the solution and getting to the solution think of think of the step, steps of mpc and uh, yeah it will help you to understand uh, what I, I try to explain also in, in this lecture that MPC is more the way of thinking, less the an exact uh, computation scheme. So with this, we come to the end of this lecture. Um, I will see if we would have also again flipped classroom in, uh, in this in next lecture. Uh, I would inform you on on model and uh, send you the yeah the the preparation slide. Well, if you have questions, just stay in uh, in in the room. If not, see you next week. Bye bye.